Thank Dwight. I uh, tried to get Dwight to lead some pumpkin songs tonight, but uh, uh, we couldn't come up with anything. But uh, anyway, we thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, all of our young people are back in the chapel area tonight for Children's Bible Hour. But uh, immediately following the service here, we'll all go outside, and hopefully you brought candy tonight and prepared to distribute that uh, to the young children uh, who are here. Uh, you know, it's always a special time when we do that, and we don't really celebrate Halloween as such, but uh, we always try to bring thoughts uh, to your mind relative to the occasion. And tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about the pumpkin-prepared life. You know, every one of us um, like to go out to the pumpkin patch. I do. There's just something about fall that intrigues me, and uh, it's one of my favorite seasons of the year. Spring is my favorite uh, because it bears the resurrection, and uh, everything is coming back to life. But I always like the fall of the year as well, and uh, people generally go to the pumpkin patch to see the pumpkins, and generally you won't find one uh, pumpkin that is like another. They're all very, very different. Uh, we have a couple of pumpkins. Uh, I'll have to admit my pumpkin patch this year was Walmart. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, we're all intrigued by the pumpkin. I learned the other day that this year over 1.5 billion, now think about this, not million, billion pounds of pumpkin will be produced, and it's generally typically true, every year in the United States of America. And the top producing states for pumpkins, I found this out, I thought this was unusual, are Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and California. I don't know what happened to Texas, but uh, anyway, I guess they're shipped in here. But when we think about the pumpkin, there is uh, a lot to be learned about it, and I think analogous of uh, how we ought to live our lives. So that's why I term this lesson the pumpkin prepared life. You know, when you, uh, those of you that carve a pumpkin generally will begin at the top, and you will carve the top of that pumpkin first of all. And you know, in reality, we must open our minds to God. Just like you would open that pumpkin up, we have to open our minds to Almighty God. That's what God seeks more than anything else. He seeks our mind. And he said that we are to love God with all of our heart, soul, with all of our mind. And when you stop to analyze the mind, the mind controls everything. No wonder God says, you know, and by the way, you'd never be able to get into that pumpkin until you open the top. And God says we have to begin at the top. We have to put him number one. We have to begin to open our minds to the truth. And the Bible says, let this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal God, of, with God. He made of himself no reputation, and he took upon himself the form of a servant. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Someone said, I pray God to empty my mind of all the anxiety, the stress, and fulfill it with the peace and the calm assurance of my God. But you know, in order to get all of the bad things out of our mind, we have to open our mind. We tell people all the time, don't we? We ought to have an open mind. And especially when it comes to God, our mind must be open. We must have that open mind. And Paul says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able, he says, to test and approve what God's will actually is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we have to begin at the top. That's where we actually start. Now, secondly... We have to get all of the bad thoughts out of the 
inside of our mind and all the evil that is there. We have to empty our mind of a lot of things. You know, it's not enough just to open our minds. If we don't make any changes in our mind, it's of no value to us. And so, you know what? When you're carving a pumpkin, you always try to get all of the seed and all the bad stuff out of that pumpkin if you're going to fix it and save it for pumpkin pie or whatever you have to do. Even if you're just going to use it for something ornamental, you do the same thing. But when you don't renew your mind, your feelings will always take you back to where you found your deliverance from the evil. So we have to make sure that we clean our mind. We hear a lot today about detoxification. Uh, maybe people that are on drugs or whatever it happens to be, alcohol. We want to detox our mind. We want to detox our life. And we ought to do that in a very spiritual way as well. If we want to honor God and we want to please God, it is something that we have to do. It's not enough to clean the outside of the pumpkin, but it's not enough for us to clean the outside of our life. We all take baths. We take showers to make sure that we're clean on the outside. But God said it's much better for us to cleanse the inside, isn't it? He rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees one time because they would clean the outside of the cup, but they would allow the inside of the cup to remain filthy and dirty. Who would want to drink out of a dirty cup that has not been washed? Why, the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians 3 and verse 2 said that we have to set our minds on things above and not on the things of this earth. And so you cannot put God in your heart and in your mind and in your life until you empty yourself. Paul calls it, calls it crucifixion in the book of Galatians 2 and verse 20. He says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it is imperative that we cleanse the inside of our lives, just like you would clean the inside of the pumpkin. And you know, David says, create in me a clean heart. The King James Version says, Give me a new heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. But thirdly, we must open our eyes to see all the wonderful things that God would have us see. You know the very next thing we do? Anybody know what we do next? <laughs> we start carving the eyes, don't we? Sure you do. And they are, look somewhat triangular. But we make sure that we clean the pumpkin out and then we open the eyes. Especially if you're going to fix a jack-o'-lantern and set it out for, for view uh, by other people. David said in Psalms 119 and verse 18, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things out of your law. You know, we're of no value to God or to anyone if we do not have spiritual eyesight. You know, to lose your eye, Marty asked that we pray for him this morning because he has macular degeneration, and I, I hope we'll continue to do that. Those of you that have those problems understand well how severe and how serious that can be. But the greater loss of vision comes to those who do not have spiritual eyes. And the Bible says to lift your eyes on the fields, for they are white unto harvest. John 4 and verse 35. And so you and I are to open our eyes to the will of God. There is a power you can't see with your physical eyes. Did you know that most of the time when God says something about us opening our eyes, he's talking about our spiritual eyes. He's not, he says one time, he, Jesus did, he said, seeing they see not. Oh, they could see with their physical eye, all right, but he says they don't see it. How often 
do you hear people say? Well, I, I, I read that, but I just don't see it. <laughs> they haven't grasped it. We have to open our eyes in a spiritual sense like you would carve that pumpkin and open the eyes of that jack-o'-lantern. In Ephesians 1, verse 18 and 19, Paul would write and say, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparability, his great power for us who believe. Notice what he says, the eyes of your heart. You know, I've met a lot of people in my lifetime through the years who were blind. Some of them were born blind, couldn't see from birth, never saw the dawn of the creation, never actually ever saw the light of day. But they had a vision that enabled them to see. There were two men one time in a hospital, and... Uh, one of them began to lament the fact, the one that was closest to the door began to lament the fact that he couldn't see out like the other one could. And he began to wail and talk about how terrible it was that they didn't place him near the window. And uh, he just said, I feel so bad, I get so depressed. Well, the man on the other side of the curtain near the window began to talk about the beautiful scenery. He began to talk about the beautiful trees and the beautiful and magnificent flowers. And the man on the other side said, that's wonderful. And he said, I'm so glad that you can see. And he said, oh, no. Oh, no. I can't see. You see? I'm blind. But in his mind, he could see it. In his mind, he could visualize the beauty of God's creativity. And when we open our mind and when we clean our life from all of the debris spiritually and we open our eyes, then God gives us a vision. Solomon said, where there is no vision, the people will perish. But number four, we must open all of our senses so we can be aware of the goodness of God around us. You know, one of the great senses of God is the nostril. We can smell. Now, I'll be honest with you, since I've had COVID-19, uh, I've lost a lot of my taste and a lot of the smell and when I thought I was clean, Audrey would have to tell me that I'm still dirty. But uh, anyway, <laughs> or did you put on your deodorant, you know? But what we do next, after we carve those eyes, we start carving that nose out as well. It wouldn't look like a face if you had no nose, would it? No, it wouldn't. No more than it would look like a face if you had no eyes. And the Bible says also, the Apostle Paul in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14, he said, but solid food is, the, is for the mature who because of practice have their senses discerned to do good and evil, to know the difference between the two. You know, the Bible talks about the fact that when we obey God and when we do his will, it's like a sweet-smelling savor that goes up into the nostrils of our God who is in heaven. And the Bible teaches us that we are to open every sense that we have to God. God says, give all your life to him, and he will lead us to the truth. But fifthly, we must open our mouths, and we must praise God and share the gospel with others. We must carve the mouth, open the mouth. How would you like to have a set of dentures that look like that? Now, that's the best I could do, folks. <laughs> I hope it serves the purpose tonight. But the point being that God opens our mouth, like we would open the mouth on that pumpkin 
to give it the full appearance of a jack-o'-lantern, that we open our mouths and we use our mouths to glorify God who is in heaven and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, if we were as prepared as a pumpkin, then we would be ready to live in the world and meet the world in which we live. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them mouth, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Matthew 8, uh, excuse me, Matthew 28, uh, verse 19 and 20. The Bible says of some in the book of Acts chapter 8, that when there was a great dispersion in Jerusalem, that those who were scattered abroad went about preaching. They opened their mouths and they proclaimed Christ. You know, one of the greatest blessings of having a mouth is the ability to talk, is the ability to convey by words. You know, stop and think about this. To be able to confess Christ... We open our mouths. We open our mouths to tell others what we believe and why we believe it. And we acknowledge Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And it was Jesus who said in the book of Matthew 24 and verse 14, he said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The end will come. But number six, we must let our light shine for God and others. Most of the time we don't just carve a pumpkin and open it from the top and get all the debris out and cut a nose and eyes and a mouth. But you know what we do with it then? We put a light within it, don't we? And isn't that what Christ said of us, that we are to let our light shine before the world, that they might see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. If you don't let your light shine, you'll never, ever be productive in the kingdom of God. You and I are lights of God. He said to let your light shine before men. He's not talking about in the church, but he's talking about out in the world. Let your light shine that they might see your good works. Why? To, so they will glorify, not you and your good works, but that they will glorify our God who is in heaven. And Paul even said to the early church in Philippians 2.15, he says, shine like lights in the world as you would hold on to the word of life. Shine, shine. But number seven, last of all, you can paint the outside of the pumpkin. Sandy always does a good job of that. Glitters it up, you know, dresses it up. But you know what? It can still be rotten and corrupt inside. It can. I've bought pumpkins before that I thought was great. You know, we had a pumpkin on the porch I thought looked pretty good. And come to find out, we opened it up. I was going to get Audrey to make us a pumpkin pie, and it was turning bad, bad inside that pumpkin. But you can paint one. You can glitter it. You can try to make it look good. But it doesn't really change the inside. And the inside is what we want, isn't it? the fruit of the pumpkin. And the Bible says that you and I are to bear fruit to the kingdom of God. And Jesus even brought reproach, spoke reproachfully of those Pharisees again in Matthew 23, 26, when he said, you blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside may also be clean. That's important, isn't it? And that just simply means to repent of our sins. You know, you want to get the inside clean, don't you? You want to make sure your heart's right. We want to make sure that the heart of the pumpkin is just right. And the way to do that, 
for us in a spiritual sense is to admit that we have sinned, grieve over our sin, and strive to stop. For the book of Romans chapter 2 says, It is godly sorrow that bringeth forth repentance. When we are sorry for what we have done, then it brings us to the point where we can repent and change and be baptized for the remission of our sin. And by the way, repentance always precedes baptism, not after Acts 2 and 38. Notice it. Repent and be baptized. Repent. Get the bad out of your life for God to shine through you and upon you. You cannot bear the reflection of the Son of God in your life. And we always pray that. May the world be able to see Christ living in me. He's not going to live in us until we repent of our sins. So we must let God have our lives. He can do much more with our life than we could ever, ever do. That's why we talk about so often about surrendering to Christ. Give your life to Jesus. He doesn't take it, but we give it to him. And tonight, if you're not a Christian, would you give it to Jesus? If you're a child of God, is there sin in your heart? Are there some things that need to be cleaned out while we stand and while we sing?